How do you create an EC2 instance from a backup? Stick around to find out how. I'm Thomas with Braintrust Digital. I'm a full stack developer obsessed with learning. If you're interested in learning full stack web development, please consider subscribing below. If you're willing to share it with a friend who's also interested in web development, it would really mean a lot to me. In this disaster recovery series tutorial, we're gonna walk through how to create an EC2 instance from a backup. The backup that we're gonna be using is an EBS snapshot. We have this snapshot available as a result of our automated snapshot lifecycle policy that we created in the previous tutorial. If you haven't seen that video, that's going to be required to complete this video. So you're going to want to pause here and watch that video. I'll link it here in the card and then down below in the description. You're going to want to watch that video first and then come back here to watch this one. In this video, we're pretending that the EBS volume attached to our currently live EC2 instance has become unresponsive and is also unavailable. This exact situation has happened to me more than once. The first step, of course, is needing to have the EBS snapshot to recover with. So that's the previous tutorial. In this one, now that you have your snapshots, you've got your safety net in place, now we're gonna talk about how to utilize that safety net to recover, to create our new EC2 instance and replace the currently downed instance. When this situation occurs, because it's the volume where your application is stored, your application goes down, and that makes sense, right? My coworker bear just stopping in for a stroll to say hello. And action. So we're gonna quickly walk through how to use that snapshot to create an Amazon machine image. Then we will use that image to create a new EC2 instance. If that sounds like something you might be interested in, then stick around for the video. All the best YouTubers transition by covering up their screen. Once you've navigated to the AWS Management Console, you're going to select EC2 under Compute, and you can scroll down to Snapshots. So here you can see I have some backups for both the AWS Rails project as well as my Braintrust Digital website. You can select the name column to sort the projects by name. That way we can just see the AWS Rails snapshots here at the top and you can see that they're organized by date. In this scenario, we're just gonna want to grab the most recent snapshot. So you're gonna go ahead and click the box next to that snapshot now. Once you select the snapshot that you'd like to create a new instance from, you're gonna select the actions menu. From actions, we're gonna select create image. What you're doing here is creating an AMI or Amazon machine image that we can then create an EC2 instance from. Go ahead and give your AMI a name. I'm gonna name it AWS Rails AMI, then you can give it a description. In my case, I'm just gonna put Disaster Recovery AMI. This is going to create an Amazon machine image from the point in time snapshot that we took via our automated lifecycle policies. You have the opportunity to change the size or volume type if you'd like. I'm gonna leave everything as is and click Create. So now you can see we've successfully submitted our image for creation. It may take a few seconds to actually complete, but we can go ahead and click Close. Next in the left-hand column under Images, you wanna select AMIs. At the top, you can see our AWS Rails AMI was successfully created. You can see the status is available. Now that we've successfully created an AMI, you can go ahead and select that, and we're going to create an EC2 instance from this AMI. You're going to select Launch. If you followed along with our EC2 instance creation tutorial, or you've created an EC2 instance in the past, you're going to recognize this form. If this form is new to you, you may want to go back and watch that EC2 instance creation tutorial. In this case, since I've already covered it, I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. So if you're looking for a more detailed explanation of this form, you're going to want to reference that other video. I can link that in the card as well as the description below. First, you'll select your instance type. In our case, we're gonna select T2 Medium, then click Next. We're not gonna change any options here on the instance details. We're just gonna go ahead and click Add Storage. 30 gigabytes is fine for our use case, so we'll go ahead and click Add Tags. We're gonna click Add Tag, and we're gonna add a name. Here, we're gonna give it a name of AWS-Rails Prod2. Number one is our currently running live instance that we're pretending right now is having an EBS volume failure. Once you give your instance a name, go ahead and click Configure Security Groups. Here you have the opportunity to create a new security group or you can just select an existing security group. In a disaster scenario, you would probably want to select an existing security group and then select the security group that you created when you created your initial live running instance. So in this case, we're gonna select our AWS Rails security group We'll click preview and launch. You have the opportunity to review your options. 
Once you are satisfied, you can go ahead and click launch. This pop-up is very important. You have to have access to your key pair to be able to access your EC2 instance. So you either want to create a new key pair if you've lost access to this, or simply acknowledge that you still do have access to this key pair before launching your instance. Once acknowledged, or once you've created a new key pair, you can go ahead and click launch instances. This may take a few minutes for the instance to spin up. So we're just gonna go ahead and click view instances and then wait for this to finish. Now that we've successfully created our new EC2 instance and it is currently passing all checks, we need to tell our domain to start pointing traffic to this new instance. So we're gonna go ahead and click on the instance and then grab the public IP. You're gonna to wanna to copy this and then we're gonna to navigate to route 53. Once in Route 53, you're gonna to navigate to your domain. On your domain, you're gonna update the A record with the new IP address that you just copied from your newly created EC2 instance. And you're gonna go ahead and click Save Record. One thing to note here is the TTL in seconds. That stands for time to live. This is the amount of time that this domain name and IP address combination is cached in DNS servers. Since ours is currently set to 300, we're gonna to have to wait 300 seconds before we will see this change reflected. Instead, you could lower your TTL, uh, but that's fine. We're just gonna leave this as is for now. Though in a disaster scenario, you may want to reduce this to uh, about a minute to get things back online and then go ahead and extend it back further out once you've successfully migrated to your new instance. After you've waited long enough to account for your time to live, you can go to a web browser and navigate to the domain absrails.com. You can see this is working, but just to prove that this is in fact using the new server, you can ping the domain. Here you can see the new IP address that we just linked to in route 53 that we got from our new EC2 instance. I just wanna interrupt for one second and see if you're finding value. Please subscribe below, hit the like button, turn on the bell notification for, for future notifications of, of content like this. And if you are, we have a limited time offer our coworker here, Bear, will perform one trick per subscriber. Yes. Down. Yes. Roll over. Good boy. You're the goodest boy. Good boy. Down. Down. Oh my gosh. We're going viral, Bear. Next, as a bit of cleanup, you're gonna to wanna to go back to your EC2 instances where you can terminate the old instance. You go ahead and click on the old instance that we're pretending has a failure and click instance state terminate. If you're a little nervous to terminate an instance, you could always stop the instance. When an instance is stopped in Amazon, you will not pay for the running cost, merely the storage cost, on the EBS attached volume. In my case, I know that I no longer need this instance since I've just proved that the new instance is being utilized. So I'm gonna go ahead and terminate. Just be sure that you wanna do this as this is an action that cannot be undone. I'm gonna click yes, terminate. This may take a few minutes to complete as Amazon's gonna shut down our instance and then destroy it. So we will no longer get charged for the instance or the storage since we have chosen to terminate it. The last thing you may want to do is update SSH config if you happen to be using it. If you're not using SSH config, I'd highly recommend it. And I have a video tutorial on that subject that I will link in the card as well as the description. So I'm not gonna go in depth here as I do so in that video. We're just gonna update it very quickly so that we can continue to use SSH config for AWS Rails project. Flip back over to the terminal and I'm gonna open up SSH config in Sublime, then navigate to the AWS Rails project and change the domain out with my new IP address and I can close that. And in the console, I can then SSH into AWS rails as that's what I've named my instance in my SSH config. I'm gonna say yes, since you're connecting to a new host. And as you can see, I successfully logged into my newly created instance. You will also want to update your deployment to deploy to this new server. So in config deploy, production.rb, we're gonna update the IP address to the new IP. I've covered deployment in a previous tutorial, so if you need help with that one, again, I will link it in the card as well as below in the description. So I hope that this has been helpful for you, and if you have any questions or requests, please let me know in the comment section below. I find this to be a, a really nice way to spin up a new instance in the event of a disaster. In that kind of stressful situation, I find this having this process down is really, really nice, can really help reduce the, uh, the stress downtime issue can cause. 
All in this process might take 10, 15 minutes to have you back up and running, which is really nice to know if you're in a disaster scenario and you just need to get everything back up and running quickly. As always, please don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll catch you in the next Disaster Recovery Series tutorial.